Welcome to topic 3.3. This one's going to be slightly longer. Don't hate me for that. Um, but it is a good one, okay? So it's, it is two pages in your unit packet. I'll try and be concise because I know a lot of you know some of this information already. Topic 3.3 is going to be that famous rhyme that we all love, um, taxation without representation. The learning objective for this topic is to explain how British colonial policies regarding North America led to the Revolutionary War. So the first thing that shows up in your packet is just an intro question, and it asks you what the chief reason for colonial discontent was. And the real crux and answer to that is just a dramatic change in Britain's colonial policy, specifically the increased taxes and trade laws that are going to occur after the French and Indian War. It was mentioned in 3.2 that Britain is going to have to pay back a decent amount of debt for the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War, and they are going to be relying on their colonies to be able to generate the revenue to pay back that debt. So British actions and colonial reactions. You guys will see um, two boxes there. It says colonists desired to defend, one, two, three, four, and then just core dividing issues. So these are going to be some of the British actions and then the colonial reactions to that. So the things that the colonists wanted to defend were the following. Local self-rule, they wanted to still be able um, to govern themselves, okay, have town halls, have these local representative assemblies that we've seen, such as the House of Burgesses, okay, and do so without a lot of interference from the British government. Um, they wanted representative government. Not only did they want to be able to rule themselves on a local level, but to appoint people themselves to those government positions. They also are advocating for individual rights. We do see that the British colonists have a very high value on that, even in some of the earlier years, as we've seen in previous topics. And they are going to really defend um, ideas of enlightenment thought. They believe in the ideas of um, John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Montesquieu, who will get into some of those enlightenment guys more a little bit later as we get closer to some of our founding documents. But we do know that the enlightenment is going on at this time and that those ideas are making their way to the American colonies as well. If you go over to the core dividing issues, these are really it. One, the colonists had no way to directly elect representatives to British Parliament. We have this government body in Parliament and in King George III that are ruling from an ocean away. And it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to colonists when these people don't live in the colonies, they don't understand what colonists go through, and they cannot put a colonist themselves in a seat in British Parliament. That was quite frankly not allowed at the time. Um, the British felt as if they had given them virtual representation, that they still were able to, you know, have the members of Parliament kind of like make decisions on their behalf. The colonists just don't think that's authentic or good enough. Um, and that's really what taxation without representation is going to come to mean. They feel like they're getting um, taxed burdensomely so, and yet they can't even vote to sit somebody in Parliament to advocate for them and say, maybe these taxes aren't fair. Maybe these taxes are too much. Maybe um, the British colonists in North America don't deserve this. They don't have the power to have that representation in the government that rules them. The second core dividing issue is that the British think their acts are justified to pay for resources and protection. The British feel like, hey, the colonists do have to like pay these taxes and listen to our rules but they have the protection from one of the greatest militaries and the greatest navy in the world. They also are going to have access to our trade and access to our markets. And they feel like that is a pretty sweet deal in the grand scheme of things. The colonists, however, see it as a violation of their rights, that they're being taken advantage of and that they're not being listened to and that they are paying all of this money for a war that they fought in already and that they're still kind of upset about. So new revenues and regulations, um, you can just go ahead and kind of take some notes on what these acts are. You might have to infer the purpose from the definition of the act, and that's fine. I'm going to do the best I can to kind of give, you by, give you guys both. Um, King George III and George Greenville, they are going to push through the following three acts at first to try and generate revenue. And the first of which is going to be the Sugar Act. This is passed in 1764. You don't necessarily need to know these dates, but I think it just gives you a good concept of chronology by putting them on the slides. The Sugar Act is going to place duties on foreign sugar and luxuries. This is also going to include a stricter enforcement of the Navigation Act. So the purpose is not only to raise revenue, 
um, for Britain, but it's also to, to stop smuggling and um, stop colonial smuggling to other countries and other markets. They want to keep revenue that's being generated from the colonies going directly to Britain and no other European power at this time. The Quartering Act is passed in 1765. This is going to require the colonists to provide food and living quarters for British soldiers. This doesn't necessarily mean that in 1765, soldiers are going to be, um, not forced, but uh, colonists are going to be forced to house soldiers in their private homes. It just means that like those communities do have to provide quarters for them and the colonists are going to have to provide food for them. So we're not quite to private homes yet. I will get to that at a later point. But the quartering act, the purpose was to make sure that British soldiers were being taken care of in the colonies, especially because they weren't necessarily paid very handsomely while they were there. In some cases, they might have to take up second jobs as well. The Stamp Act is also going to be passed in 1765. This required that the stamp that excuse me, stamps be placed on official documents. This is actually the first direct tax that we see placed on British subjects in North American colonies. And what I mean by a direct tax is that in order for any colonist to purchase one of these stamps to put on an official document, um, usually that had to do with like legal documents, letters, things like that. If they were purchasing one of these stamps to make it official, they that individual colonist themselves would be paying that tax. It wouldn't be like a merchant paying the tax on a cargo of, I don't know, like let's say tea or sugar, let's say sugar. It wouldn't be like the Sugar Act, for example, I kind of stumbled there. The Sugar Act, for example, would be like the merchants of like Boston, let's say, when they purchased like a huge freight uh, or um, chest of sugar, they would pay the tax. And then as a result of them paying the tax, the price of sugar would go up for the colonial consumer, okay? The Stamp Act is just being directly paid by individual colonists. So that's kind of the difference between a direct and an indirect tax at this time. The Stamp Act is really just to raise revenue. They want to be able to raise revenue, the British do, from the American colonists at this time. And they kind of want to exert their control over them as well and tell them they're the boss. So the reactions to the Stamp Act, because with each of these, there is definitely going to be a reaction. Um, Patrick Henry, and you can kind of just, especially the words in bold, you can take note of in that four term chart that you have in front of you. Patrick Henry is going to speak up against um, the act, right, in the House of Burgesses. James Otis is going to call for cooperative action and representatives from nine different colonies are going to meet in New York for something called the Stamp Act Congress. This is where they determined colonial authorities um, are the ones who really should be approving all taxes, not necessarily British Parliament, but people who represent the American colonies themselves. This is also pretty important because it is a sign of unity for the colonies at this time. Granted, only nine are going to attend and discuss this, but we are starting to see slowly and slowly more over time that these British colonies are acting together and becoming more unified. Um, it doesn't mean they're all the same yet. They still do think of themselves as distinct colonies of Britain and not as one unified entity, but we see attempts of them working together. Another group that's going to appear at this time is the Sons and Daughters of Liberty. They are going to be a secret society that intimidated tax agents, destroyed stamps, and feathered revenue officials, tar and feathered them. We'll talk a little bit more about the Sons and Daughters of Liberty in class uh, when I see you guys next. And they are going to be doing these things to kind of protest and show that they are not favoring the Stamp Act and other violations of their liberties at this time. They are also the Sons and Daughters of Liberty, that is. They are going to conduct boycotts against British imports to put economic pressure on the British. And these are actually going to be the most effective form of protest. It's not going to be some of those like more well-known like sensational protests like the Tea Party or events like the Boston Massacre or even the tarring and feathering that's really going to get the British to listen. It's um, colonists really protesting with their money, protesting with their dollars. If they're boycotting British goods, the British are not making money off of their colonies like they want it to, right? And that's the sole purpose of the colonies according to Britain. And so when American colonists are not buying their goods, Britain is losing revenue, their plan is not working with this taxation, and they're going to have to kind of reconvene and figure out how to navigate this in a way that the colonists will still purchase their items. 
The Declaratory Act of 1766, um, this is where Greenville, okay, so the man who's implementing a lot of these taxes, he actually um, replaced and the stamp, sorry, he is going to be replaced and the Stamp Act is going to be repealed. The Act reminded the colonists, the Declaratory Act, that is, they put in the Declaratory Act once Greenville's out and the Stamp Act is repealed. The Declaratory Act basically declares that Parliament and England have the right to tax the colonists in all cases whatsoever. So I always say the Declaratory Act is kind of like a parent reminding their kid that they're the boss. Like if you're getting in trouble with your parents, you're staying out too late and you're like breaking curfew or you're not doing your homework, um, your parents might kind of put in things to punish you. And then slowly they might take away those punishments, kind of like the, the Stamp Act, right? But they're going to come back and be like, hey, you have to remember I'm the boss and you need to make it home for curfew when you need to do your homework. So it's just declaring again and reminding the colonists that they're the ones in charge, that they are the mother country and they have to be listened to. Okay, so the second phase of the crisis, you kind of just need to take down these terms um, underneath where they appear in your packet there. I'm not really looking too much from that, but just kind of know they bleed into one another. The town shunned acts are going to be first. This is going to be enacted new duties to be collected on imports like tea, glass, and paper. Okay, so they're taxing those items. These were used to pay crown officials in the colony. So when they send over um, soldiers or they send over um, people to kind of regulate trade, let's say, the way that they pay those individuals is going to be through the town shunned acts. They are also going to allow British authorities to search private homes for smuggled goods with only a writ of assistance instead of a warrant, okay? All you really need to know is that a writ of assistance is a little bit looser than a full-fledged legally obtained warrant is. Um, at first, the Townshend Acts were kind of accepted. They weren't wildly unpopular. They weren't widely co wildly controversial. Um, because they were indirect, okay? So again, merchants might have to pay these taxes and merchants typically were a little bit wealthier. They might kind of up the prices of these items. But however, after a little bit of time goes on, and especially with this idea of only needing a writ of assistance instead of a warrant for smuggled items, we start to see greater calls of taxation without representation, that these acts aren't really as justified as they had once thought. Letters from a federal farmer, that's going to be written by John Dickinson after the passing of the Townshend Acts, and he's going to advocate for colonial approval of taxation if no representation in Congress, uh, or no taxation without representation in Congress. So basically he's saying like the only way, again, the British should be able to tax the colonists is if the colonists have somebody seated in Parliament to advocate on their behalf. The Townshend Acts eventually, with some of this controversy, are going to be repealed because of the damaged trade and the little revenue that they're going to yield. Okay, we do see, again, boycotting is going to be one of the most effective ways that the colonists combat all of these acts and these taxes that are being placed on them. If they're not buying those products and if the British aren't making enough money off of the taxes that they're putting into place, they're going to have to adjust. Uh, what was still allowed and what was still kind of kept into effect was a small tax on tea to be able to still generate some revenue. So that is there and that will lead into something further in a second. So another part of this second phase of crisis is on um, something that's really popularly known in American history called the Boston Massacre. And this too is something that we'll look at a little bit more closely in class. But on a snowing, snowy day in March of 1770, a crowd of colonists are going to harass British officers by the courthouse. And this is going to turn into the Boston Massacre. So if you look at that like famous image of the Boston Massacre, it's an engraving um, that we see done by Paul Revere, and I forgot to throw it in here, but it's a poster in my classroom. The really famous like picture of it that it's in a ton of different classrooms throughout the United States, it's actually kind of sensationalized. That picture and a lot of the media, quote unquote, or newspapers and pamphlets at this time made it out to be that the Boston Massacre was unprovoked and that the British just opened fire on the crowd. When in actuality, um, the colonists were actually harassing them, they were taunting them, they were throwing snowballs with rocks and ice in them at these British soldiers that were in front of the courthouse and they started yelling the words fire, which provoked the British soldiers to fire into the crowd in self-defense. So the guards do fire into the crowd. They do kill five Americans, the first of which is going to be Crispus Attucks, and many consider him 
to be one of the first, not one of the first, really like the first casualty of the American Revolution, although we haven't seen an official battle yet. He is going to be an African and he is going to have American Indian heritage as well. And he's later going to be a symbol of the anti-slavery movement down the road. Six soldiers um, that were involved in the Boston Massacre, British soldiers, that is, they're actually going to be defended by John Adams, who will one day be the second president of the United States. These soldiers are defended by Adams and they are acquitted of murder, but two are going to be convicted of manslaughter. So just a couple of things I want you guys to think about before you come into class um, is, was this a massacre? Okay, do we actually think the Boston Massacre can truly be called a massacre? And then I also just kind of want you to think about why John Adams, who is related to Sam Adams, who's one of the founders of the Sons of Liberty, why would John Adams defend British soldiers in a court of law when he himself is an, an American colonist and a pretty notorious one at that? So just think about those and kind of let that mull over in your brain before you come to class. Okay, so the renewal of the conflict. Um, we see that tensions are going to rise again, especially off after the Boston Massacre. This is where Samuel Adams, who is the leader of the Sons of Liberty, or one of them at least, he's going to organize something called the Committees of Correspondence in 1772. The Committees of Correspondence, they exchange letters about suspicious British activities, and they just really kind of keep tabs on what the British are doing, what American colonists should be concerned about, and how they can counteract some of these occurrences without necessarily going to court before. The Gatsby, this is going to be an incident that's really frequently cited in the letters between the committees of correspondence. It's going to be the Gatsby itself. It's a British custom ship that caught several smugglers. And once it landed offshore in Rhode Island in 1772, colonists knowing that it caught several smugglers that were American colonists, they disguised themselves as American Indians and they actually set fire to the ship. This is kind of, at least this last part, right, disguises American Indians and, you know, Sons of Liberty in general. Um, that should sound kind of familiar to the Boston Tea Party as well, sort of, as it's, it's similar. The colonists, they're going to continue to boycott British tea, but the British are going to pass the Tea Act in 1773, which made tea cheaper than the Dutch. So this is kind of funny, actually, because the Dutch did, were the main competitors of British tea. And colonists were happy to be able to spend their money on Dutch tea if they could, rather than British tea, because of their disdain for the British at the time. However, even though the British make their tea cheaper, hoping that the colonists will buy the cheaper British tea, and the British will be able to generate revenue from their colonists, Americans, especially in New England, are still so angry with the British and their mercantile policy that they refuse to buy the tea for British tea because they're just so angry at the British at this time. Um, what the British do is they ship a boat of this tea to Boston, but find no buyers, okay, because they are boycotting the tea. They don't want to buy it. Um, Boston is like one of the hotbeds for the beginnings of the American Revolution because of all of the, the trade and, you know, mercantile activity that's happening there. So they ship that um, boat of tea to Boston. Nobody wants to buy it because they're angry with the British. And what the colonists do, members of the Sons of Liberty, actually, they're going to disguise themselves as American Indians like they did with the Gatsby. They are going to oops, conduct the Boston Tea Party. And they take 342 chests of tea and dump them into Boston Harbor. This results in a multi-million dollar loss for the British because all of this tea that they could have sold for profit and for revenue is now going to be at the bottom of the harbor and completely ruined. This is where the intolerable or the coercive acts come into play. These are going to be the acts that really frustrate the colonists on a much deeper level. There are technically four acts that are a part of the intolerable or the coercive acts. There's technically two names for them. The colonists really called them the intolerable acts because they thought that they were ridiculous. So the four acts are the Port Act, the Massachusetts Government Act, the Administration of Justice Act, and the Quartering Act, which is kind of a refresher. The Port Act, this is going to close Boston Port until the tea was paid for. They basically said that no trade is going to go through Boston Harbor as a result of what happened to um, all of the tea and the multi-million dollar loss of the Boston Tea Party. So that's the first part. The Massachusetts Government Act, what that does, 
the British decide to reduce the power of the colonial legislator. And this is really something that upsets the colonists on a deep level because it's going to limit their representative government, which we already know they feel very passionately about. They even feel passionately about not having a representative in British Parliament. So not even being able to have local government representation is something that's really going to agitate them. The Administration of Justice Act, that's where royal officials are going to be tried of crimes in England, meaning that if a royal official committed a crime here in the colonies, they would not be tried in the colonies. They would be tried overseas in England instead, where they were much more likely to be found innocent than if they were tried here in the colonies, where they would be much more likely to be found guilty. The Quartering Act isn't new but it's going to be expanded to private homes. Now, individual colonists who have their own private home would have to quarter soldiers that were you know, on the enemy's side if you were a patriot at this time. And that's something that just feels like an invasion of privacy, feels like it's an invasion of American colonial liberty. And that's something that deeply upsets them as well. The last one, you can kind of just put this under the demand for independence because I messed up on the packet. So just like, this last part for demand of independence, you can put the Quebec Act instead. That's my mistake. The Quebec Act is going to establish Catholicism as the official religion of Quebec, and it's going to extend the Quebec boundary to the Ohio River and set up a government with no representative assembly. So you might be wondering, like, why does something in Canada matter to the British colonists at this time? Um, well, the British are going to have control over Quebec, but they are separate from the other North American colonies that will eventually become the United States, okay? Um, the reason why this is concerning for the colonists is because one, most colonists do not like Catholicism, okay? They really are kind of against it. Most of them are Anglican, um, especially in New England. We know that they like to stay in their own kind of lane with their religion and they don't like that being messed with. Additionally, when they extend their boundary to the Ohio River, colonists are going to be upset because they're thinking, hey, like that's part of that land that we fought for in the French and Indian War. Are the British kind of taking land that's supposed to be ours and giving it to other colonial subjects instead? That's not fair. They didn't necessarily fight for that land. And then finally, if they're setting up a government with no representative assembly over in Canada, the, the colonists are thinking, does that mean the same for us? Are the British going to try and further restrict our own democracy, our own local governments, and our own representative assemblies here in these colonies that we've already formed. So this is where you guys, I know we're at the end, yeah, um, this is where you guys are going to stop and answer the following two questions. And you're mainly, for the first one at least, you're going to come up with evidence to support your claim. And then for the second one, you're just going to tell me um, an effect and a cause of that particular thing. So one is exercising, making a claim or picking a side and um, solidifying that with evidence, right? Or solidifying that with examples. And then the second one is getting you to practice cause and effect relationships. So the first question, were the Sons of Liberty justified in the Boston Tea Party? Um, so either pick yes or no. You can just throw that in the box to the left if you want. And then you're going to defend your answer with three pieces of evidence or three reasonings or three examples as to why they were justified or why they were not justified. Please remember the more specific your reasonings or your evidence, the better. Like, can you cite a specific tax that was unfair? Can you cite a specific British action that was unfair? Um, answers that are proper nouns or have capital letters are probably best, but do the best you can. And the second question is explain how the intolerable acts were both an effect of colonial actions and a cause of colonial action, okay? So the intolerable acts, meaning these, the ones the colonists really, really hated, how were they an effect of colonial action? So what did the colonists do to have these inflicted on them, okay? And then how are they also a cause of colonial action? What are the colonists going to do as a result of these acts, maybe, like what are some ideas that they might kind of go forward and do in the future to resist that? So just kind of think about that, let that marinate over, answer those questions in your packet, and then you can go on and you guys can read section 3.4. Section 3.4 is going to deal with the philosophical foundations of the American Revolution, which is mainly just going to be a lot of enlightenment stuff. So once you're done reading that section of the text, you can go ahead and you can move on to the video for 3.4.